Hey everyone, welcome to today's training. We've got the seven secrets of consistent Forex profits webinar masterclass. And yes, this is a masterclass because I have seven lessons for you that are jam packed with actionable content so you can start using it today and improve your performance. The agenda for today's training is first, we're gonna talk about this misconception about indicators. We're also gonna talk about drawing support and resistance, and I'm gonna show you a few tricks that I use to find the most accurate levels. I'm also gonna talk about confluence because it's so important that you use it to stack the odds in your favor. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm also gonna show you two ways that you can identify potential reversals in the market before they happen. I'm also gonna share with you three trading strategies that I use, including a continuation pattern, a reversal pattern, and a candlestick pattern that I use all the time to make profit. All right, I'm also gonna share what ratio I use for my risk to reward. And it's something that I teach my members and can make all the difference in the world. And lastly, this is the way that you can double your profit on one setup without increasing the risk for that setup. And again, it may sound too good to be true, but I assure you that myself and my members are doing this all the time. My promise to you is that by the end of this training, you will become a better trader, okay? If you really devote yourself and learn this stuff, you can start using it right now, today, to become better. And the only thing I ask of you is that by the end of this training, you take at least one of these lessons, one of these tactics, and implement it into your trading, and I guarantee that you will see results. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the first topic. And the first thing I wanna talk about is ditching the indicators. So what that means is we're gonna get rid of every indicator on your chart. And this is really gonna set you up for the rest of this webinar. So it's gonna, it's gonna set the foundation for you to be able to trade price action. All right, so this may be a little bit basic for some of you, but just hang with me because I promise you that later lessons are gonna get into some more advanced topics. Um, and, and this section is really gonna make your chart easier to read. All right, so there's this common misconception that you need indicators to become profitable. Well, guess what? You don't need indicators to become profitable in this business, and I'm proof of that. When I entered the market back in 2007, I thought that my job was to find this magical combination of indicators, such as the RSI or the MACD, um, that was gonna make me millions of dollars. I thought that's, that's just what I was supposed to do. And that's really not the case. Now, for me, there is one exception, uh, two in fact, and that is that I use the 10 and 20 exponential moving averages as a mean reversion tool. Um, I'll cover that in a moment, but I do wanna just mention that there's nothing special about the 10 and 20 EMAs. It's just what I found to work the best, okay? So you can experiment with an eight and a 15 or a, a 12 and a 25. It doesn't really matter, but I found that the 10 and 20 work pretty well in any market. All right, so let's talk about mean reversion really quick. Um, and this is really important because it prevents you from buying high and selling low. So mean reversion is this idea that prices always come back to an average in a trending market. And I'll show you an example in a moment, um, but this is where the 10 and 20 EMAs come in because I use them as a way to avoid buying high and selling low, right? Because we want to do the opposite. So I'll show you an example in a moment, but first I want to run through some of my chart settings. All right, so in MetaTrader, um, and if you use a different platform, that's perfectly fine. You'll just have to check with your broker to figure out how to change these settings on your platform. But in MetaTrader, if you right click on a chart and go to the properties tab um, or select properties and then go to the colors tab, there's a really quick way to get the look that I have and that is to go to color scheme and select black on white. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna change all of these settings over here. All right, so that takes care of all of the colors on the chart. Now, as far as the grid and everything else, on the common tab, if you select chart shift, select candlesticks, and show open high, low, and close, and just make sure everything else is deselected. All right, now you can play around with these settings. This is just how I have my chart set up, and it works out really well for me. Okay, so next up, let me run you through the settings I have for the 10 and 20 exponential moving averages. And for the 10, um, the period here is gonna be 10, 
and the method is exponential. And you can find, and I'll show you this in a moment where you can find this within the MetaTrader platform. Uh, for the 20, obviously the, the method is gonna stay the same as exponential and the period we're gonna change to 20. Now, for those of you who are more visual, let me just pull up a chart of the Euro USD here. And this looks rather intimidating. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure if they still do it, but MetaTrader used to start new accounts this way. So if you were a brand new trader, opened a brokerage account, downloaded the platform, this is what you would see. And to be honest, for the way that I trade, um, this looks pretty confusing, right? We've got a MACD down here, Stochastics, RSI. So the first thing you wanna do, or the first thing we're gonna do, is get rid of each of these. Okay, so we're gonna delete Stochastics and we're gonna get rid of the RSI. And get rid of both of those levels. All right, there we go. So you can see already that we have a lot more real estate to work with and that's what we want. We want as much room as possible to be able to see the price action on this chart. All right, so now to run through those settings I just showed you, if you right click on this, go to properties and under the colors tab, go ahead and select black on white. And under the common tab, we're going to turn off the chart on foreground and I'm also gonna turn off these two down here. So the only thing I should have left is the chart shift, candlesticks, and show open high, low and close. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And there we have it, a nice clean chart with black on white. To get the two, the two moving averages that I mentioned, the 10 and 20 EMAs, I'm gonna go up here to view and navigator. And from here, the, I'm gonna drag the custom moving average onto the window. And under the inputs tab, I'm gonna select 10 and exponential. All right, I'm gonna do the same thing for the 20. So I'm gonna select 20 and change this to exponential. Oh, I wanted to change that to uh, blue actually. Okay, so, and again, I'm gonna provide you guys with some notes afterwards, so if I'm running through this pretty quick, uh, don't worry, um, be sure to take your own notes, but I'll also provide you with these slides after the presentation. So I'm gonna close out of this window, and there we have it. We've got a nice black on white chart, lots of real estate to work with, and I've also got my 10 and 20 moving averages. All right, now, let me just explain where these moving averages come into play and if you'll remember, I mentioned mean reversion a few slides ago. So with the Euro USD, what we're looking at here is the mean, the average for this market right now, for this trending market is right here, right? So it's right in between the 10 and 20 moving averages. So right now with price up here, I don't want to buy, right? I'm not gonna buy up here because there's a good chance that the market is gonna come back down here into this range, right? So in a trending market, that's where you would wanna buy, somewhere in that area. And of course, we would use key levels to find that, which I'll get to in the next lesson. Um, but if you notice down here, right, this is where you'd wanna buy, back here as well. Okay, so we wanna avoid, obviously, buying too high and selling too low, and that's how the 10 and 20 EMAs help us. So. Now that we've talked about getting our charts set up and your chart should be nice and clean now, um, let's go through and talk about mastering support and resistance. And let me just say right off the bat that this is one of those topics that I really can't stress enough because I've said it before that if you get this right, trading becomes almost effortless. And if you get it wrong, you're gonna struggle a lot more than you have to. Uh, think about it this way. When you were a kid, if you had a coloring book, Right, your job was to color in between the lines. Well, support and resistance are no different. Once you have these levels on your chart, your job as a trader is to trade between the levels. So go ahead and write that down now in your worksheet or your notepad that your job as a trader is to trade between support and resistance. Let's run through a few uh, key points here and then I'll get into an example all right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is that 
you should use, when you're trading price action, it's best to use the daily and weekly timeframes to find key levels. All right, most of my, I would say probably 90% of the levels I draw come from the daily and weekly timeframes. Now between the daily and weekly, I would say that probably 70 to 80% of the levels I find come off of the daily, right? And the other 20 to 30% come from the weekly. So next up is to focus on the swing highs and lows. So the first thing you wanna do when looking for key levels is focus on those highs and lows that really stick out. And again, we'll take a look at an example in just a moment. Next up is to include as many touches as possible without cutting off the upper and lower wicks. So what does that mean? By touches, I'm talking about the, you know, the upper and lower wicks that touch off of the level, whether it's a horizontal supporter resistance or a trend line, you wanna to try to get as many touches on those levels but you also don't wanna cut off too many wicks. So it's a little bit of a balancing act, and it's also something that just comes with practice. And speaking of trend lines, don't forget about them. I know a lot of traders don't favor trend lines, they try to stick to horizontal levels, and that's okay, you can do that. But I will say that if you're not using trend lines, you're really missing out. And in another lesson, we're gonna get into trend strength, right? We're gonna get into how to spot reversals, and if you're not using trend lines, you're gonna be at a huge disadvantage. So just be sure that when you're drawing these levels that you don't forget about the trend lines. So how do you know that you've drawn a level correctly? Well, this is where price action comes in because what I normally do is I'll allow the market to show me whether or not my level is accurate, right? So it kind of helps me to justify whether I should keep that level on my chart or just get rid of it. All right, so you always wanna make sure that you're letting the market do the work for you. So if a market comes, comes around and doesn't respect the key level you have drawn several times, you probably wanna think about getting rid of that level because it's probably not something you wanna pay attention to. All right, and this one is um, a little known secret that I'm gonna show you there's kind of a, a, a certain science to drawing these levels on your charts. And you'll notice that once you get good at this and you start drawing the levels, a lot of times there's a, a certain distance between, between each level. It could be 100 pips, it could be 200. Typically it's some kind of range um, that could be something like you know between 250 to 350 pips. And once you start to see that type of pattern, right between these horizontal levels, what you can do is actually use that same range to find the next level in the sequence. All right, so we'll take a look at that um, on the Euro USD chart in just one moment. And last but not least is don't go overboard. All right, keep the levels to a minimum. Don't try to have 20 or 30 levels on a chart because what's gonna happen is you'll have so many levels on your chart that you won't be able to trade. You won't have enough space between them to be able to put on a trade. So you wanna focus on the really key levels in the market, which are usually those swing highs and lows. All right, so let's pull up the charts again and run through an example here on the Euro USD. All right, so the first thing I wanna point out is, if you'll remember, I mentioned that we wanna focus on the swing highs and lows. So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw out some of these swings on here and we'll take a look at whether or not we can use these to draw key levels. All right, so what I wanna do is just take my horizontal level here and anytime I, I'm presented with a blank chart, I wanna start with my horizontal levels and once I do that, then I can start looking for trend lines or channels or wedges or things like that. All right, so the horizontal levels are sort of my foundation when I'm presented with a blank chart. All right, so the first area I wanna look at, because I can tell right off the bat that this might be something worthwhile, is this level right here. We can see we've got this swing high and this swing low back here. The next area that I pointed out was this here. Okay, now it does get a little bit choppy through here, but that looks pretty good at the moment. And the next high is this one here. However, look at how close these are together. So what I wanna do now is just look back 
on my chart. And we can see this one up here that I just drew a moment ago actually looks pretty good because we've got this swing low back here as well as some, some lows through here. Um, however, this one gets pretty choppy. If you'll notice, there's really not much happening here. All right, so I don't think I wanna keep this one on, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete that for now. All right, so if I move down, I've got, <clears throat> excuse me, this, uh, this area right here. So we've got a swing high and we've got a bunch of lows back here. And then I've got a level right here where we've got this swing low back here and some lows here. And then I've got this major swing low down here. Um, now you'll notice that there's really not much down here. However, the fact that this is a multi-year swing low, you better believe that if the market comes down here and tests this level, that there will be some sort of buying. All right, so I wanna keep that one on my chart. Okay, so let's see. There's another little swing high here, but I'm not, yeah, see, notice how this, this gets choppy through here, so that's not something I wanna keep on my chart. I'm looking for the really obvious stuff, folks. That's that's what we wanna focus on, all right? So as far as up here, I mean, this has been pretty much a straight up market. I mean, there's not there hasn't been much of a pullback, no swing high here, so I'm gonna move out to the weekly chart, and you'll notice that we've got this swing high right here, and we've also got a swing high back here. However, again, these are really close together, so chances are it's gonna be one or the other. And if I move in here, you can see that it's definitely this lower one and not this one here because it gets choppy through here. All right, so I'm gonna remove this one, and that one looks really nice. All right, so if the market comes back into this area, again, there will most likely be some buying through here. Okay, now as far as where the market might find some resistance going forward, again, if we move out to the weekly chart, we've got some major swing lows back here. And actually the market's testing this major swing low back here right now. So if I move into the daily chart, we can see that yesterday the market found some selling pressure up here. All right, so that's a really quick way of how I go through and mark my horizontal levels. And one thing you'll notice is there's a bit of a pattern, right? This isn't a perfect science, but if you'll notice, there's about 300 pips between these levels. There's about 260 pips between these levels. The one exception here really is this area right here. Um, Cause down here again, there's about 340 pips. Um, there's about 260 pips. So the idea here is that the next level, right, is likely gonna be somewhere between 250 to 350 pips higher. All right, so if you start getting areas like this where, you know, notice everything's kind of spaced evenly and then you get a, an area like this, you know, chances are one of these two levels is incorrect, okay? It could be like that or it could be this, you know, or it could be here. Um, so it's not always gonna be the case but a lot of times you're gonna find that there's gonna be even spacing between your horizontal levels. All right, let's wrap things up with a trend line. So uh, for that, if I come back here in the market, there's actually a really nice area that I'm gonna show you. And I wanna focus on this one because it kinda of highlights the idea that you wanna get as many touches as possible without cutting off too many wicks, all right? So if I draw my trend line here, starting at this low down here, you'll notice that there's two ways to draw this. And this is this is the big question that traders have is they say, well, should I draw it here where I've got this lower wick and this lower wick? Or, right, do I draw it up here where I'm also including this swing low? And here's my rule. And, and it, you know, again, not an exact science, but this has worked really well for me is I try to get as many touches as possible. And it's okay if I cut off a little bit of a wick here and a little bit of a wick there. What you don't want is you don't want to start doing this, okay? Notice how I'm cutting off all this here, I'm cutting off you know, more of this wick and I'm cutting off almost half of this candle back here. So if I would draw the level here because I want to include that swing low. Now, 
Granted, this is in hindsight, so it's a bit easier. However, if I pan forward, we can see that the market found selling pressure up here when it retested the level, right, as new resistance, okay? So it looks like that would have been the correct placement. And again, you know, it's easier in hindsight. However, if this had happened in real time, this is what I would have wanted, all right? So I would have wanted to include that swing low right there. Okay, so, you know, that's just a, a quick uh, lesson, guys, on how I go about drawing key levels. Um, just make sure to focus on the swing highs. Don't forget the trend lines. And, you know, one key trick here is to make sure that your levels are spaced evenly. It won't always be the case, but a lot of times it'll make your job a lot easier if you start spacing your horizontal levels evenly throughout your chart, just don't forget about those swing highs and lows. That's actually the perfect segue into our next topic, which is confluence. All right, now confluence is gonna to help to increase your odds of success because essentially what we're doing is we're looking for areas where key levels intersect. All right, so confluence is the act or process of merging and for a trader what that means is we're looking for areas where a trend line may intersect with a horizontal level and it's really just a three-step process where the first thing we want to do is identify things like horizontal levels trend lines and even channels all right we want to draw those levels as soon as we open a blank chart so remember i mentioned a little bit ago that as soon as I open a blank chart, I want to get my levels on there um, as soon as possible. Once I have those, I can start looking for areas where they intersect. And those are called areas of confluence of support or resistance. And then it's really just a matter of watching for buy or sell signals from those areas. And here's a great example of one that I commented on a while back. And you'll notice that we have this trend line here and we also have a horizontal level. The third thing now for confluence, all we need is two levels. So those two would have been enough to create this area of confluence. However, in this case, we also had this ascending channel and what was great about this setup, and I actually uh, I actually shorted this market um, to the downside on a break below this level. But what's great about this kind of setup is that no matter what the market does, you can trade it. All right, so if it comes up here into this area, we can look for sell signals. If it closes below this level, we can look to sell. And alternatively, if the market comes up here and closes above this area of confluence, then we could have a potential long opportunity on our hands because the market is breaking out from this area of confluence. All right, so um, let's go ahead and jump into the chart now. And I'm gonna show you an example that also occurred on the British pound versus the Japanese yen. All right, so we're back to the chart now and I'm gonna pull up the daily chart of the British pound versus the Japanese yen. And the, the setup I'm going to look at right now is this bullish pin bar right here. And if you're not familiar with the pin bar, it's okay because I'm going to cover that in one of the next few lessons. But right now, what I want to draw your attention to is we had this horizontal level right here. And if I scroll back, I can actually see where the market made this high back here. And it, it doesn't touch it exactly, but it's within that area. Um, so this would have been one that I wanted to watch and we had this bullish pin bar now on its own uh, This would have been a decent setup, right? So we're talking about this bullish pin bar and the reason it would have been a decent setup is because we had this horizontal level and If we do a proper analysis here, we can also see that this market was in an uptrend, right? It's making higher highs and higher lows but there was also another level here that we could have traded off of. All right, so if I come back here, 
there was actually a trend line. And um, now obviously we wouldn't have seen any of this at the time. Okay, all we would have seen were those two touches and this horizontal level. Now, when this bullish pin bar formed, all right, we would have really honed in on this area because again, we have this intersection right here, which is a confluence of support. So this bullish pin bar became a lot more appealing because we have an uptrend, we have a horizontal level, and we also have trend line support. Now in hindsight, just to show you how this level actually affected the market afterward, we can see that it played a critical role in the, in the reversal over here where the market tested it here, here, and a few times just before it broke down and then retested it as resistance. All right, so, but again, you know, the key here is to focus on these areas that intersect because you're gonna find some of the best opportunities with the highest um, percentage of success, okay? So this bullish pin bar would have been one that I would have traded because it formed during an uptrend and also at a confluence of support. Okay, so next up is a topic that I get asked about quite often. Um, it's probably one of the, the most common questions I receive and that is, how do we tell when a trend is about to reverse? And the first thing I wanna say is that it's not our job as traders to know what's about to happen. That's true for the direction of the market um, as well as the buy and sell signals that we look for. So when we talk about trend analysis, it really comes down to figuring out what's likely. Is the market likely to reverse or is it likely to go higher? And there's a few different ways that we can identify that um, but first I do want to talk about a few of the various trend lengths, all right? So it's important to understand that there's three different types of trends. First off, we have a long-term or secular trend, and that's one that lasts for five years or longer. Next up is intermediate or primary, and that's a trend that lasts for at least one year. And last but not least, and this is the most common that most people look at, is the short-term or secondary trend. And that's one that lasts for a few weeks or a few months. And the reason I say it's the most popular is because most traders that I've spoken with over the years use something like the 15 minute or the 30 minute or even the one hour time frame. So typically they're looking at a, um, a period of time that spans about one week, maybe two, up to about two or three months. And that brings me to an important point and that is that the terms uptrend and downtrend are really incomplete thoughts without specifying a length of time. So if you come to me and say that the Euro USD is in a downtrend, my next question is gonna be, well, are you referring to the long-term, intermediate, or short, short term? Because that's gonna matter. Um, if you're talking about the last few weeks being in a downtrend, if we scroll back on a chart, maybe the last three, four, or five years, the pair is actually in an uptrend. So saying that something is in an uptrend or downtrend is really an incomplete statement. All right, so now that we know that, let's take a look at what, what um, actually illustrates or defines an uptrend or a downtrend, and that is the swing highs and lows. And uh, you know this is what we've been talking about this entire presentation, is that much of what we do as price action traders comes down to swing highs and lows. So here we can see that we have a market, and granted this is just an illustration, but I'll get into an example in a moment. But here we have a market that's making higher highs and higher lows. And this is really basic stuff, but honestly folks, this is what it comes down to. As a price action trader, everything that we do is really pretty basic. Okay, and just the same for a downtrend, as you might guess, it's the opposite, right? So we have a market that is making lower lows and we've got lower highs. Okay, so now as you might guess, the way that we identify a change in trend is also based on those swing highs and lows. All right, so here we have a market that has made in the beginning 
higher highs and higher lows. So if we look back here, we can see that we've got higher highs back here and we've got higher lows. Now notice that this swing high right here is the first time that the market didn't make a higher high. So if we see this, this is kind of a sign of exhaustion. So if you're looking to buy, you might want to be careful at this point, but it's not until this low down here that the market really starts to reverse. All right, so again, really basic stuff, but you can also see how powerful this can be. Now, remember a bit ago, I mentioned that if you're not using trend lines, you're at a disadvantage. And here's what I'm referring to. So again, just an illustration, but we're gonna look at a chart in just one moment. And here I want you to notice how this market was making higher highs back here but all of a sudden it started to make lower highs. And what's really key about this is that every test of the trend line in terms of the days it took to rally higher and come back and retest it was shorter and shorter. So we had 35 days, 25 days, 10 days, and then five days. Now the result in most cases when a market does this is a break to the downside. All right, so notice that same exact illustration, what happens is the market closes below the trend line and then it retests that level as resistance. Now, this is the area right here that we wanna look for sell signals. All right, so when we talk about how to identify that a market is likely to reverse, using a trend line in this way and watching um, how the market reacts to that level over time is really key. Now, another way that you can also identify a change in trend is in addition to looking at the amount of time it takes for a market to test a trend line. Okay, so here we have the different points where it's testing and notice that it's also getting smaller. However, in this case, we also have what I call clustering or sometimes as heavy price action. And what that means is that you get a market that starts to retest it um, you know, back here, this may have been, let's say 20 days, 10 days, five days. And then all of a sudden you get these tests that only take a day or two. Okay. This clustering price action right above the key level. And again, in this case, the result is typically a break to the downside. Now here's one that happened, um, on a chart a while back. This is actually a four hour chart and you'll notice how the currency pair was in this ascending channel and you'll notice how the distance between these retests is fairly close, right? It's not getting closer. And then notice what happens right through here. Okay. Notice how this price action starts to cluster back here. It took literally less than a day for the market to rebound. And then back here, we had several days worth of price action just hovering above that key support level. And again, what happens most times is you get a close below the level, and this is where we wanna look for selling opportunities. And as promised, I'm gonna wrap this up with a uh, chart of the GBP JPY. All right, so this is the, the same chart we looked at in the last lesson, and it's also the same trend line. So we have a few things happening here. I'm just gonna get rid of this horizontal level. Uh, let's see, delete, all right. So we have a few things happening here. And the first one that you'll notice is that each retest takes less and less time. All right, so notice how much time it took for this first retest to happen. And then this next one took about half that time. And this one up here was about the same time too, but then look what starts happening. Okay. And in addition to that, we also get this clustering price action right above the level. And you compare that to these retests back here that happened rather quickly. And you can see how we could have used what we just learned to 
determine that a break lower was likely. And that's exactly what we did here. All right, so if we zoom in and take a closer look at the breakdown. Okay, so the breakdown happened right here. And it's also important to note that this is a daily time frame. So we want to we want to trade this on a daily closing basis. And what that means is that these wicks right here don't concern us. All right, the market may sometimes do this where it trades below the level on the intraday, but the daily time frame closes above or below the level. In this case, it kept closing above it, right? So this was not a break back here. Now the first close came right here. And you'll notice that after that close, it retested the level a few times right through here. And again, that's where we'd wanna look for a selling opportunity and if I zoom in even closer, you'll notice that we had, on the very next day, we had a bearish rejection right here. So we could have used that to actually sell the retest of this trend line. So you can see how powerful this is because the market from there ran several hundred pips. Um, in fact, I think this move uh, actually totaled over a thousand pips eventually. So. Um, extremely lucrative, but also really, really simple. But the key here is to look at the, the amount of time it takes for the market in between retests and also watch out for that clustering price action. Okay, so now that we've talked about the 10 and 20 EMAs, we've talked about support and resistance, we covered confluence, and we've also talked about a couple of ways to identify possible trend changes Let's get into some of my favorite strategies, all right? And we're gonna start with the pin bar. You may be familiar with this one. And the basic idea is that this candlestick pattern shows a rejection of support or resistance. All right, so we have the tail, the body, and also the nose. Now, what makes this candlestick pattern effective is this right here. So the tail should be two thirds of the entire range so from the high to this low, and the same goes for the bullish pin bar over here. All right, so this should be two thirds of the entire range. And the color of the body doesn't really matter. All right, so it doesn't matter if this was black or white. Um, same, same goes for this. If this was a white candle or if, or if it was a down day and it was black, um, that doesn't matter. What matters, again, is this tail right here. All right, so let's take a look at an example on the New Zealand dollar. And this one actually occurred, it's a bullish pin bar that occurred at horizontal support. So we have this level right here and you can see where it was tested once before. All right, so we had this retest and then we had this bullish pin bar that formed. Now again, notice how long the tail is. So this is certainly two thirds of the entire range and there's two ways to enter this uh, this type of candlestick pattern. The first is to, in this case, buy on a close above the high and our stop loss would go below the tail. Now the second way is actually to do a 50% entry right here using the Fibonacci tool. Um, the upside to this is that you can increase your R multiple. The downside, of course, is that you won't always get filled. So if you notice here, the market never actually came down this far. So in that case, if you had a 50% entry right here, you would not have been filled. All right, so, and just to show where I would have targeted in this case, I would have looked at this area right here because we have these two lows back here and we also have these highs. All right, so just remember that with the pin bar, the two most important things are the placement. So you wanna look for a key level and also the length of the tail relative to the range of the candlestick. The next pattern we're gonna take a look at is the head and shoulders. And this is probably my favorite reversal pattern. They don't come around that often, but when they do, you should really pay attention because they can be extremely reliable and also offer some incredible risk to reward ratios. So I'm talking over 10 R. So if you're risking 2% of your account balance, it can be over a 20% profit. All right, so 
It's made up by a few characteristics and it's really a pretty basic pattern. We have the head up here. We then have the left shoulder and the right shoulder. This level right here is called the neckline. And a key characteristic of this is that it occurs after an extended move higher. Now there's also an inverse head and shoulders pattern which occurs after an extended move lower. All right, so all the characteristics are the same. The only difference is that it occurs after a downtrend versus an uptrend. Okay, so if we head on over to the charts, I'm gonna pull up the New Zealand dollar versus the Japanese yen. And just like some of the other structures we've looked at today, uh, this is actually one that I commented on as it unfolded. All right, so here we have, we're on the weekly time frame, and you can see that this is the left shoulder over here. We've got the head and the right shoulder. So this was actually a really nice neckline right here because we had all of these touches line up almost perfectly with it. Now the break happened right here. And in this case, the way that we would find the measured objective is we'd measure from this high up here down to the neckline. And then we take that same distance from the break and measure to a lower point in the market. All right, so let's take a look at what that was. So we can see here that this is almost exactly a thousand pips. So if we come over here and measure a thousand pips lower, all right, that brings us to right about here. So this would have been our profit target for this entry. All right, so we would have entered up here. This right here is the break and our target would have been this level here. All right, so that's our target. And if you look, what's interesting about this is if you look over here, you can see that we actually have several lows that had formed a few years prior, all right? So that's a great way to validate this measured objective and know that you have the right level. All right, so in closing, just a few things to keep in mind. This should be traded after an extended move up. And I also don't trade it on anything below the daily time frame. All right, so I only trade this pattern on the daily and weekly time frames because I found that those two are the most reliable. The third strategy I wanna look at today is the channel. All right, so we have the ascending and descending channels. Now you may have also heard these referred to as a bull or bear flag, which they can be. They aren't always a bull or bear flag, but they are quite often. All right, so we have a few simple characteristics here. We have a preceding trend we have consolidation and then a continuation of that trend. All right, now this can also form at a descending angle, which would be a bullish pattern where the market trends higher, consolidates lower, and then continues higher. So what we wanna do is once we have these levels drawn, we want to wait for a close, a break of support, and then we wanna to look to sell on a retest as resistance. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the British pound versus the New Zealand dollar. All right, so we're on the British pound, New Zealand dollar. And at first glance, um, this may not look like a whole lot, but we actually have an a ascending channel here. So if I draw this top level first, okay, let me just get this accurate here. And then if we draw the second level down, you can see that we actually had a, a really nice um, ascending channel where the market had made this move lower. And this part right here is the consolidation. All right, so this is the part that we don't wanna trade. What we wanna do is wait for a close. And again, we're on the daily time frame here, so we wanna wait for the close below support. That's the break, okay? Once we see that, we know that we could have a potential setup on our hands. And if you'll notice, the very next candle produced a bearish pin bar. So what we'd wanna do is enter on a 50% retracement right here. Stop loss goes above the candle high. Now our target for this, the measured objective for a pattern like this is actually found by measuring this entire move down right here. So we measure from this top to this bottom. And where a lot of traders get this wrong is they then measure from here to a lower point, but you actually wanna measure from up here. So we're gonna measure from this high to a lower point in the market. And when we do that, 
All right, I'm just gonna run through this rather quickly. So we get, let's see. All right, so we come up with this level down here. Now, as you can see, the market didn't quite make it down here, um, but it, it came within about 30 pips of it. So that's a pretty good target uh, considering this was over 2000 pips. All right, so in this case, um, the stop loss distance up here, just to give you an idea, was about, uh, let's see, 150, about 150 pips right here. And the target was just over 2000 pips, all right? from So from a risk to reward uh, standpoint, that was uh, quite the trade. So the key takeaways here is you wanna stick to the daily and four hour charts, and you don't wanna trade this consolidation. Instead, what we wanna do is wait for this breakout to trade with the prevailing trend. Okay, so the next two lessons really bring us full circle for today's training. And the first one I wanna talk about is a favorable risk to reward ratio. Now, the way that we define a risk to reward ratio is with an R multiple. And it sounds a bit confusing, but it's really simply just one number that we use to identify the profit to loss ratio or the risk to reward ratio for any given trade. So some examples are if we had a setup with a 100 pip stop loss and a 200 pip target, it would be a 2R setup. Similarly, if we had a setup with a 500 pip target and a 100 pip stop loss, it would be a 5R. And again, 300 pip target with a 50 pip stop loss, it's a 6R setup. So all we're doing here is taking the target and we're dividing the stop loss amount, right? The risk into it. So, you know, if we had a 600 pip target and a 100 pip stop loss, it would be a 6R setup as well. Where some traders get tripped up is with a 1R loss. Now, what does 1R represent? 1R always represents the amount that you risk. So it could be represented as pips or a dollar amount. So a 1R loss is $100 and you make $200, you have a 2R profit. If a 1R loss is $100 and you make $500, you have a 5R profit. And again, if a 1R loss is $50 and you make $300, you have a 6R profit. All right, so just remember that 1R is always the amount that you're risking. It can be pips or a dollar amount. So that begs the question, what is a favorable risk to reward ratio? And my requirement for every single setup I take is 3R. So if I'm risking 100 pips, the target has to be at least 300 pips away from the entry, all right? So that allows me to have a win rate of less than 50% and still make money. Now, of course, I always want my, my win rate to be higher than 50%, um, but this allows me to make money even if it's lower than 50%. So I could have a 40% win rate or strike rate and I can still make money that month, all right? So one thing that I do wanna hit home here is that a trading edge is your entire trading style combined. So it's not just the strategies that you use, it's everything from the timeframes to uh, trend analysis, to the strategies, to the amount you're risking, to the risk to reward ratio. So your edge is a combination of all those factors. And the reason I bring that up is because a lot of traders think that, well, if you have a true edge, you should have a win rate higher than 50%. And I always have to counter that with the fact that my risk to reward ratio, my 3R minimum, is really part of my edge. So if I have a month where I only make, I let's say out of 10 trades, I lose on six of them and I make money on four, that's a strike rate or a win rate of 40%. That doesn't mean that I don't have an edge because I could have still made money that month with a favorable risk to reward ratio. So you see that ratio is part of my edge. All right, so I hope that makes sense. So, you know, your edge, really the seven things I'm teaching you today, all of these things can become part of your trading edge that in the long run will make you money. Okay, so how do you find the profit target and the stop loss placement that make up these ratios? And the key here is that you always wanna use the support and resistance levels that we learned earlier. So it can be a trend line, it can be a horizontal level, um, it can be a combination of a horizontal level and a Fibonacci, some area of confluence. But the idea here is that you always want to use these key levels to make up your targets and also define where you enter and your stop loss placement. 
And last but not least, always, always, always determine your profit target and stop loss placement in advance. And the reason for this is that as soon as you enter a position, you're no longer unbiased. Okay, you have a bias, you want to make money, and that can influence your decision. So you always want to you always want to come up with these placements before you have money at risk. Last but not least, we have the topic of pyramiding, which is probably my favorite topic to cover because I love talking about how to increase our profit potential without increasing the risk. So what is pyramiding? It is strategically adding to a position as the market moves in our favor. So you never wanna to add to a position if it's losing. So if you short the market and it takes off to the upside, you don't wanna to add to that. So we wanna to add to a position as it becomes profitable. As far as timeframes go, I have found that anything above the four hour time frame is the most reliable, okay? And you wanna avoid dropping below the four hour time frame when adding to a position. And a little bonus tip here for you is if you're just starting out with price action, you wanna avoid dropping below the daily time frame, okay? So if you're just beginning, try sticking to the daily time frame until you become consistently profitable. Once you do that, then you can start experimenting with the four hour. As an example, if we were buying this market, all right, so if this market was in an uptrend and it broke above this key level, let's just assume that this is the daily time frame. So a daily session closed above this level down here, retested it as support, so we'd wanna buy right here. Now, the second position comes in once the market comes up here and closes, and again, retests this level up here as new support. So at this point, we've got two positions on. And really we're just doing the same thing up here. Market closes above, we're buying again, so we've now got three positions on. Now you may be wondering, well, that's great and all, but we've now got three positions on. It sounds like we may be over leveraged on that position, but here's the beauty of pyramiding. The entire time that we're adding, as the market moves up, once we put on the second position, we're trailing our stop loss. Okay, so we're trailing our stop loss up here and we are now in a no lose situation. Once the market comes up here, breaks this level and we put our third position on, we once again trail the stop loss and once we're up here, we are in a no lose position. Okay, there's no way we can lose position up here or lose, uh, lose money up here because we've now trailed our stop loss. We've got a buy here, another position here, and we're adding again up here, but look where our stop loss is. All right, so the beauty of this is that we're trailing our stop loss as the market moves in our favor. Let's bring that all together and then I'll wrap up with an example on a chart. So in terms of percentages and our multiples, we're risking 2% on this first position. The market then rallies higher, closes up here, retests support. At this point, we're putting on the same size position, right? We're putting on 40,000 units. And again, our risk is 2%, okay, at 40,000. And so we're moving our stop loss up here into a break even position. The market closes above the next level. We buy up here, again, trailing our stop loss. So notice that the, the position size is the same all the way up. Okay, so in terms of percentage, what that does is it turns a, a 6R, right, an R multiple, uh, which would be 12% profit if risking 2%, it turns that into a 24% profit or 12R because these two positions added another 12% profit or 6R, okay? 4, 4R plus 2R right here, those two positions. So now you're not gonna get a lot of these um, setups like this, but let me tell you, if even if you just get a few of these each year, uh, which you can do, it can really add up. All right, so that's the, the, uh, the beauty of pyramiding is that we're increasing our profit potential as the market trends and we're also covering our risk along the way. All right, so let me show you an example now on the, uh, the Australian dollar versus the USD. All right, so we've got the Australian dollar versus the US dollar here on the daily time frame. And the first thing I wanna do, and, and just so you know, um, this is how I had my chart set up at the time. So I had this trend line up here, 
drawn across these two highs. All right, so we had this trend line and you'll notice what happened here is the uh, the market had, had come up here and sort of just churned sideways, but slightly higher, right? So this was the, the uh, consolidation that I was watching. And believe it or not, but that was actually a sell signal. And let me show you why. Um, this is called an upward sloping flag and it's actually something that I also teach. Um, so we had this consolidation right here. All right, so it's kind of the opposite of a bull flag in a bull flag if the the channel had formed at a descending right at a downward angle it would be a bullish pattern however because it formed at an upward slope it's actually an exhaustion pattern all right so what i did is i waited for the market to close here and then i sold up here okay so i sold here and i had levels at the time i had levels drawn right here and I also had a level down in this area here um, because you'll notice that we had this low and this high. So this was a bit of a, a pivot for the pair. And we also had these highs back here and these lows. Okay, so remember I had my first position was up here and my target for this trade was actually um, in this area, it was the second level. Um, the reason it wasn't this first level is because the market had spent several weeks rallying and I said, you know what, if this thing is going to break down, it's probably going to go lower than this first level right here. So I had trailed my stop on this day when the market sold off. I did start trailing my stop loss. However, my target was down here. All right. So this was the final target and the entry was up here. All right, so once the market closed below this level, I said, all right, you know what? I'm gonna look for another sell signal on a retest of this key level. And notice that we got a bearish pin bar right here. So using the 50% entry strategy, I entered short here. So now I've got two positions on with the same target. So the way this works out is, let me just go ahead and clear this off and show you the numbers so the first entry up here stop loss went above that candle high my target was down here second entry all right so this this right here was a 30 pip stop loss this target down here was 160 pips okay so that that right there was a 5.3 r now this next position was also a 30 pip stop and to this target right here was about 100 pips it was just shy about 95 pips or so um, so that works out to about another three r okay so another three r and this one was 5.3 r so you can see how this works out that the initial trade was a 5.3 r which is not bad at all because that means if i were risking one percent of my account balance that would be a 5.3% profit. And considering this only took, uh, let's see, six days to play out, a 5.3% profit in six days is nothing to sneeze at. However, once I added that second position, right, we changed that into an 8.3 R setup. So I essentially increased, if I was risking 1%, I increased my profit potential by 3%. And again, the beauty of it is once I trailed my stop up here, I was in a break even trade. So I couldn't lose on this. So I initially, I basically added 3% profit potential and also capped my risk so that I wouldn't lose any additional money. So you can see how this can be really, really profitable. Um, as always, folks, just keep it simple um, and also stick to the daily time frame if you're just starting out. Um, you can get into the four hour time frame, but I really advise those just starting out to stick to the daily and weekly time frames. And then as you get really good, you can drop down to the four hour. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, leave your comment below and be sure to subscribe to my channel. See you next time.